1940, a Russian scientist named Trofim Denisovich Leshenko was named director of the Institute of Genetics within the Soviet Union's Academy of Sciences. Believing Western genetics to be inherently ignorant of other cultures, he denounced the groundbreaking work of Gregor Mendel and came up with an alternative science. Later dubbed Lyshenkoism, this science denied the existence of genes and hoped to produce superior agricultural crops for the entire USSR. Lyshenko then used his official power to squash dissent, imprison and murder anyone who still tried to argue for Mendelian genetics, and set the cause of Russian science back decades, all while causing millions of preventable deaths from disease and starvation. While this was underway, a British veteran of World War II named John Wyndham Parks Lucas Bainan Harris, or more succinctly John Wyndham, inspired by H. G. Wells's The War of the Worlds, wrote a post-apocalyptic science fiction novel in which Leshenko is the unseen creator of a new species of flesh-eating plant, unimaginably deadly but capable of producing a valuable substance that vastly improves the efficiency of fossil fuels. It seemed disturbingly plausible, and thus, not only did John Wyndham become one of the most renowned British science fiction authors of all time, but he also gave birth to the Triffids. Bill Mason is at the end of a long wait. On the morning when the doctors are supposed to remove the bandages from his eyes following a delicate surgery, he finds himself abandoned and alone. When he finally tears the bandages off himself, he sees a world torn apart by disaster, where nearly everyone has been blinded by an unexplained celestial event the night before. As he walks the broken streets of London looking for answers, he soon discovers that there is an even greater threat on the horizon, an invasive species of carnivorous mobile plants called triffids that are exploiting the apocalypse to walk all over mankind. Before we go any further, if you could please hit that like button, I'll promise not to abandon you to the outside world. If you really do like this video, please hit that subscribe button as well. Thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. Almost universally hailed as an instant classic when it was published in 1951, John Wyndham's The Day of the Triffids was first optioned to film producers Albert R. Broccoli and Irving Allen, who failed to nail down a decent script. Then the blacklisted screenwriter Bernard Gordon penned an adaptation that eventually made its way to screens in 1962. This version of The Day of the Triffids is a sci-fi classic in its own right that I will probably cover one day as soon as I can get a hold of a version that doesn't look and sound like a digitally compressed bad copy of a bad copy of a damaged print, but it deviates so much from the source material that it is not looked on fondly by the novel's fans. In the late 1970s, the television writer Douglas Livingstone wrote his own, far more faithful adaptation for producer David Maloney. The two men knew each other from when they had both been aspiring actors. As a director and producer, Maloney had cut his teeth on Doctor Who, and was in the midst of producing Blake's Seven when he was offered the chance to put together a television version of The Day of the Triffids by BBC, who made the offer not knowing that Maloney was a fan of Wyndham's work. However, the project was deemed too expensive, forcing all involved to delay the production by a year in order to work out a co-financing deal between the BBC, the Australian Broadcasting Commission, and the American RCTV. The setting of the script was changed to the modern day and written as six 26-minute episodes, while still being surprisingly true to the source material. With the well-regarded Australian filmmaker Ken Hannam hired as director, they set out to find the cast. John Dateen plays the lead character of Bill Mason. Dateen was a rising star following his work on Jesus of Nazareth and To Serve Them All My Days, and he had worked under producer David Maloney before on Zed Cars. He does well in the part, easily handling the occasional voiceover narration and selling his everyman quality while being a somewhat aloof and morally uncertain character. To play his love interest, the upper-class Josella Payton, Ken Hannum hired Emma Ralph, a relatively unknown actress whose career unfortunately never took off. The character has changed a little bit from the novel, with her upper-class roots toned down and the subplot of her minor celebrity for writing a salacious book called Sex Is My Adventure 
being totally omitted. The other main lead is Maurice Colburn as Coker, the antagonist-turned-friend who kidnaps and later joins Bill in the search for Sanctuary. With the rest of the cast made up of various bit players contracted by BBC Drama who are no doubt more familiar to British television audiences than they are to me. That said, Star Wars fans might know the actor playing Alf, John Hollis, who also plays Lobot in The Empire Strikes Back. And any Trekkie worth his salt will recognize Bill Mason's father, played by William Morgan Shepard. Since you're all going to die anyway, why not tell you? As for the Triffids themselves, they were designed by Steve Drevitt, who had not only worked under Maloney before on Blake's Seven, but who had also worked at the Natural History Museum and had amassed extensive trivial knowledge about various plants and animals that proved useful. He wanted the Triffids to share qualities with several carnivorous plants, such as having a bright, attractive coloring to lure its prey. The walking plants were made out of sawdust, rubber, fiberglass, and latex surrounding a small go-kart seat for the operator, with a cooling fan hidden within the Triffid's neck. The stump-like clackers were operated by remote. Other than that, there weren't too many effects, outside of a few mats and a particularly silly visual effect involving the so-called Triffid gun, which is thankfully only fired once in the entire series. There were a few problems with fire, particularly in this scene where they nearly set ablaze the goldsmith's estate in Acton, but no one was seriously injured and the only real expense involved was procuring the flamethrowers. The title sequence was put together by Douglas Byrd, who died during production in an unrelated plane accident, and it used 35mm film with quantized color levels. It's suitably eerie, but you can't deny how silly it looks when this lady gets hit by the stinger in slow motion. Filming began at the end of March 1981, and only lasted a little over a month. Most of the series was filmed on location in various places around Greater London and Sussex, with some sequences requiring citizens to abandon the streets to make them look barren. The music was composed and arranged by Christopher Gunning, who crafted an understated and atmospheric score that is more moody and suspenseful than bombastic and exciting. Honestly, I think Gunning's work is one of the highlights of the entire series, with the haunting theme that plays over the title sequence setting the exact right tone for every episode. The Day of the Triffids first aired on BBC One roughly 40 years ago this month, from early September to mid-October in 1981. Audience scores were mixed, but critics were generally appreciative of it, praising in particular the faithfulness of the storytelling and the performance of John Dateen. It did have a lot of staying power, however, with subsequent reruns garnering unusually high ratings, and it is today considered a cult classic. The original novel has been credited as a primordial zombie tale, with the story containing several tropes that would become relatively standard in that subgenre, including an introduction that inspired both 28 Days Later and The Walking Dead, where a man wakes up in a hospital bed to discover that the city has undergone an apocalypse while he's been out. There have been several radio productions of it, along with another BBC television adaptation in 2009 with an all-star cast that I haven't seen yet, and a sequel novel penned by Simon Clark called The Night of the Triffids was published in 2001. The word Triffid has found its way into a few dictionaries over the years, including the Oxford English one, as a slang term for any large plant that grows out of control, and the story, as best epitomized by the faithful 1981 adaptation, remains in the zeitgeist today. What I find most fascinating about the Day of the Triffids is how many different ways one can look at its themes. John Wyndham was practically obsessed with showing the fragility of mankind, of how easily a strange new variable can disrupt society in disastrous ways, and in his novel, and in the 1981 adaptation, it is mankind's own hubris and greed that have rained terror upon the planet. The Triffids are engineered by Russian scientists for industrial purposes, and the blinding of the population is blamed on a satellite-based weapon run amok. Bill Mason delivers a great speech in the final episode, laying this out as clearly as possible. We were walking on a tightrope for a hell of a long time. Sooner or later, the foot had to slip. But that's hardly the only theme going on here. There's also the idea of a post-colonial Britain facing a role reversal as humanity gets herded and controlled by a physically superior force, 
which leads into a future where what remains of the British military appears to have learned nothing and is in a great big hurry to exert authoritarian control in order to assert British superiority over the rest of the world. This theme is appropriate, given how similar it is to the main theme of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds, Wyndham's primary source of inspiration. However, the theme that works best, especially in the series, is the underlying and deeply uncomfortable moral dilemma faced by the few people who remain sighted in a world of the blind. Rather than being kings, like the proverb says, they face an overwhelming urge to help an ocean of the helpless, unsure how to do it or where to begin. In the series, Bill faces this problem almost immediately upon first emerging from his hospital bed, when he is begged by a blind man to stay and help his family in the entire apartment building they reside in, and this is before anyone has even realized about the Triffids. What follows are a series of thought experiments about how best to help the world, or whether it is morally right to abandon the afflicted in order to save your own life. There is no right answer, and the only people who seem to have moral clarity are those who are intent on denying the blind people their basic human rights. Then there's Coker, who tries to force people to be charitable by chaining ten blind people to every sighted one as a kind of dictatorial welfare state. This predictably fails, resulting in more human misery, and Coker is left questioning his own morality by the time he and Bill come to a sanctuary ruled by religious edicts of charity that are just as well-intentioned but also just as ill-advised as his own scheme. Coker wants to help, but he finds himself faced with the reality that he can neither save the people nor reject community, that he must either adapt his morality or die in vain. This is, I think, the true horror of the story, and it has little to do with the Triffids, which are more of a background threat to drive the plot forward rather than a significant problem to be solved. It's also what separates it from a typical zombie yarn, where most of humanity is already dead at the start. In this apocalypse, the people are still alive, at least at first, but they are rendered lame and helpless by mass blindness, already headed for a brutal and agonizing death long before they are menaced by the giant man-eating plants. In that respect, the Day of the Triffids is a deeply relevant political parable about the complicated problem of public conscience, of the difficult conundrum of harshly mandated charity versus coldly reinforced social Darwinism. In our community, babies will be more important than husbands. This is lacking in the original 1962 film adaptation, and as I understand it, it's not really present in the 2009 version either. However, the 1981 television series focuses an unblinking eye on it, making for a compelling and unsettling experience that is absolutely a sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings! Have you seen any of the adaptations of The Day of the Triffids? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you really do like what I'm doing, consider joining my Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. You can also check out my website at emagill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Until next time, though, when I'm gonna shake things up a bit and hold hands with a psychedelic Macaulay Culkin, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody.